Okay, I'm going to ask you this question again, and I want an answer this time. Do you follow any professional sports? What's your favorite professional sport to watch on TV? You watch golf? I have to say I admire your attention span. You're pretty dedicated to your sport, aren't you? It's amazing you don't get sick of playing and watching the same thing. Although I guess you can pick up a few pointers for your game that way. I've been asking you a lot about your health and it seems that working out and eating right are two big components of it all. Along with getting plenty of sleep and sex, two of my favorite things. But it seems that your human body is still so delicate. All the working out and dieting in the world can't make sure that something won't just go wrong anyway. That's where your physicians come in. Do you go to the doctor regularly? That's to your benefit. Besides, it's another excuse to get naked. Okay, I did not think you would say that. My apologies. Let's move forward. And, uh... <laughs> oh, God. Alright. Okay, so let me give some context. So, uh, this is an extremely weird game called Seaman. It was created for the Sega Dreamcast uh, quite a while ago uh, by a famous game designer, Yute Saito. And part of its appeal, I guess, is that you talk to and kind of help out, help grow these animals. Now, um, I guess one of the appeal is that you never know what they're going to say, and I really wish I had watched more of this video before I had just shown that. Um, but keep in mind, this is the opinion of a unique little fish here. Um, so anyway, uh, I encourage you to look up this game, uh, check it out. Uh, it actually, hold on a second. Okay, we're going to show one more clip that I actually have viewed before. Uh, that is do, 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 on the topic of uh, taking care of yourself. Uh, and it is not uh, so risque as what we just heard from the uh, strange seaman. Let's take a look. So, we've been talking a lot about the health of your body. That's, of course, extremely important, but it also helps to have a healthy mind. So, to that end, have you ever gone to a therapist? It seems that a lot of people think that maintaining their mental health through the efforts of a therapist is a sign of weakness. Yet, most people don't see going to the doctor for a physical ailment as a sign of weakness. Strange how people think sometimes. I hope if you ever feel you have a problem you can't handle, you'll consider seeing a therapist. Or you can just come talk to me. At least I won't charge you. Much. By far, the most mysterious part of your human body is the brain. Even your greatest scientists will freely admit that they barely know anything about how it works. And yet, when something is wrong in your head, I'll bet it hurts just as much as a wound or a disease. I hope you take care of your mind as well as you take care of your body. Or better, since you don't seem to be too keen on keeping your body tip-top. So this was a game that actually had uh, microphone features to it. Well, thanks so for letting me in the, on uh, some of your health health secrets. So the Seaman uh, would essentially, uh, you'd take care of it, you would try and keep it alive, you would make sure its tank was the right temperature, you'd feed the Seaman, and you actually would have a microphone on your controller, your Dreamcast controller that you'd actually have to answer these questions with. Uh, so yes, no, you know, you'd talk to the the seaman, and uh, it would, basically it would talk back to you, right? And have some unique quips and all of that. So anyway, a very strange game. If you find a veteran game designer, they will almost certainly have something to say about this game. 
uh, and how it works and how unique it was, particularly at the time, uh, before AI and chatbots were really much of a thing at all. Okay? Uh, but uh, yes, l let us be thankful that uh, no one watches these streams uh, too early before 1130 comes around. Um, anyway, uh, we will go ahead and put the Seaman back in his cage uh, where he probably belongs and we'll move on. Um, okay, so uh, let me see here who, who can remember or who can guess what, song, what game... Uh, this song right here is from okay this might be a little bit of a hard one but this soundtrack has a very very distinctive style to it uh, so let's go ahead and, and give it a listen I uh, I want the version that you submitted, please. Uh, as in the the one you submitted for judging at the game jam. All right, and that is perfect timing. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, so everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. It looks like we only have about twenty six people right now, and it's you know I, it it's hard to uh, uh, it's it's hard to complain. Uh, I know that everyone is still trying to recover a bit from the project two turn in. Uh, maybe a little bit of a crunch going on at the end of that project, hopefully not. Um, but we are moving into a very exciting part of the semester, right? Chat, help me out. What happens today? What, uh, what has been unleashed on the course today? Uh, 
Boom, Project 3. In fact, if you look in Canvas right now, you should find the spec for Project 3. Uh, this is a very, very cool project in part because it is your final project. Now, if anyone uh, joined us, is joining us, who didn't watch our previous lecture, maybe you decided to sleep through it, you know, because you, you crunched all night, hopefully not, but um, go back and watch that lecture. We do go over the Project 3 introduction. We talk about P3. And we, we're not going to do that again today, okay, even though it is releasing today. We'll take a brief look at the spec for your first deliverable in that project. Um, but before that, we've got uh, a few fun announcements for you. Um, so this is, uh, this is just kind of a fun post. If you are a little bit miffed that this course doesn't go into the low-level details of game engine programming, because we simply don't have enough time, unfortunately, um, uh, then you might find this particular link interesting. So this is a little presentation I found online. Uh, that just drills down. It's kind of it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit terse and a little bit um, goofy in its humor. Uh, but this is a presentation all about optimizing C++ code at kind of a low level. So if you look at this function, uh, which I believe is trying to determine which side of a plane or which side of a, yeah which side of a plane a sphere is on, uh, then uh, this is actually fairly inefficient, and this code, this presentation will point out to you little reasons why. You don't want to put something like this into a tight game engine loop that's being executed thousands of times per second, right? Um, anyway, it's just a lot of this stuff that's kind of interesting. It's all done via this interesting brief sticky note format. So I hope you will enjoy. I'll post this presentation right after class, okay? Anyway, um, I want to mention quickly some common uh, early P3 issues. This one is not relevant. But during a normal semester, um, you don't want to uh, uh, require keyboard usage if your game also makes heavy use of the controller. You'll run into this interesting situation where like, you'll need to restart the game by hitting escape. But the entire game is played with the controller, right? So going back and forth, that context switch is very expensive for the user, and it's just not very fun. Uh, so it, it, it breaks their immersion. Anyway, not a huge issue this time because all of your games must have keyboard functionality. Um, something to consider. If your P3 uh, gold spike, if your P3 game ends up being kind of simple and it's not long enough, usually games uh, for P3 want to last about 5 to 10 minutes in length. If that is uh, too long for what you currently have or, or the idea you currently have in your head, don't forget about the possibility of round-based game structures. So, you know, if your game tends to be very kind of quick draw style, where you go into a match, it ends really quickly in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, um, then consider building out the game's kind of meta game uh, by including rounds, right? Okay, so you need to win three rounds to take the entire match, and each round you win actually the game disadvantages you to try and, and get a negative feedback loop going uh, to, um, to to bring the game in, in and make it more competitive, okay? Uh, so consider stuff like that. Art consistency. Um, so you don't want your game, and I'll probably bring this up later toward the end, but you don't want your game to look like sexy hiking, okay? Oh, no! Oh, what a shame. Did GameMakerGames.com just, uh, did it die? Uh, that's a shame. Sexy hiking game. Okay, I need to add game on there. Make sure we don't get any spicy results. So let's see here. Okay, so this is Sexy Hiking. This is the title screen of Sexy Hiking. Okay? And if you look at this, this game tends to be seen as kind of hideous, right? If you look at not the title screen, but an actual gameplay screenshot, you'll see that you've got different art styles. You've got this, this kind of detailed texturing for the environments, but then the hammer is 3D, okay? And the legs are 3D, but your face is 2D with no texture at all, okay? And the, the background has no detail at all either. So this is called a clash, uh, an art style clash. You have many different things in your game. They, they seem to use different art styles and not in a way that's useful, okay? Um, instead, look at a game that is as simple in its, its visuals, but much more cohesive, right? Uh, this is Undertale. Everything in this game uses this 8-bit style, and so while everything might look simple, it also looks very cohesive. And after getting over the initial shock of how simple everything can look, many people would describe it as looking very nice, right? It's very cohesive, they've got good character designs, uh, and so it is. Uh, it looks like it was meant to be this way, 
where sexy hiking looks like it was a mess uh, created in a, 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 a 24 hour uh, game jam, a short game jam. So anyway, uh, let's uh, keep going. So when you submit your project three, uh, you need to remember to submit your credits.txt. Don't forget to do that, okay? A lot of teams will use external assets in some way on Project 3. Don't forget to provide credit for it in a credits.txt, and then maybe later in-game itself with a credits menu, okay? Um, so another thing to think about is if your game is going to have time pressure or it's going to have statistics or UI, okay? And, uh, your game's almost certainly going to have UI, Think about, can I embed the UI into the game world itself somehow? Okay, so here's an example. Uh, at the end of some Resident Evil games, uh, you will, you'll have to escape in a certain amount of time. So you could do this in two ways. You can put a piece of text at the top of the screen, but that kind of breaks immersion a little bit, right? Uh, that is something that could never happen in real life. It is a very video gamey thing to do uh, that a lot of other games will do. Um, and so what sometimes you'll see is that horror games will take those those doom clocks and they'll actually put them into the game world itself. So instead of seeing a timer counting down at the top of your screen, they'll put it on a bunch of monitors in the in-game environment that you can almost always see, okay? That way, your UI is embedded into the game world itself. You don't break the immersion as much. Another thing that Resident Evil will do is instead of having a health bar on screen at all times, they'll indicate the health of your character by the pose and animation they use when they're standing and walking. So as, if your character's fine, they'll just be a normal idol, right? However, if they are damaged, they'll have like this, uh, uh, right, this really tired sway to them. And that's a way of embedding elements of the game state that would normally be in a health bar in the UI into the actual game world itself. Uh, to get you a little bit more immersion. These are just some quick things that you should keep in mind as you're thinking about how your 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 uh, P3 uh, gold spike, how your main mechanic should be represented in the UI, okay? Anyway, all right. Traditional tech companies hiring game devs. We're seeing it more and more. You already know that uh, KFC is dumping money into game dev, and I believe uh, General Motors and Quicken Loans is as well. Um, here is General Electric. Uh, that apparently is hiring uh, the, the, the people with game dev tech, uh, knowledge. Uh, a role that, that, that came out of the mountain. Okay, partly due to increasing popular online games. Okay, what are they using this for? To train robots to inspect hazardous areas via virtual reality technology. Okay, um, so there's just a lot of interest. In, uh, there's a lot of um, companies these days who maybe that not hiring game devs in mass, but they have a lot to gain from from having that kind of knowledge on their team, okay? And it's actually very interesting. If you look at uh, the game engines themselves, Unreal and Unity, uh, Unreal just opened a shop, a, a, uh, an office in Detroit. And part of the reason why is that Unreal is trying to court the automotive companies uh, to use Unreal Engine for modeling, for visualization, and for simulation, okay? Unity is trying to do the exact same thing. Uh, they actually sent someone out to the IGDA not too long ago uh, to talk with us about uh, Unity's rendering capabilities as far as automotive goes, okay? So anyway, uh, it's just game dev is merging with the rest of technology and society and popular culture, uh, and so it's a, it's a good time to be a dev, for sure. Okay, so another parallax example, uh, because I just, I just can't, I don't, you know, I, we, there can't be enough examples of parallax in this course. Look inside of this white box that you see sliding. Okay, this is the screen view. And you can see that there's several layers to this environment. You have this grass and building layer, and then you have a background, a mountain, and distant city layer, right? And the result of all this, you can also see that the actual grass you're on actually jumps from place to place as your camera moves to that position uh, to make sure that a performance on mobile would, would stay okay, right? Um, and same thing with the parallax layers. They hop to make sure that we don't need a billion copies of the, that layer, right? Um, and the result is this. This is how it looks in game. Uh, it looks very nice. So totally 2D game. This is a game that we made for a YouTube uh, children's meal prep uh, channel. Uh, and this is how it looks in game, right? So anyway, you got that little view of it anyway. Uh, so a purely 2D game, you get this incredible depth to it. 
Um, so it's a it's a pretty good time. Okay, uh, so let's go and get the parallax component here. If you want to use our parallax component, you can grab it there. And there's also a parallax manager singleton game object that you can grab here as well that makes all those components work together, okay? Um, mental health awareness moment courtesy of Seaman. I'm gonna leave this in here. We watched it earlier in the uh, uh, lecture uh, as we were getting started. Uh, and Seaman uh, 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 trolled us a little bit by saying something I didn't expect uh, him to say. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please rewind to the earlier part of lecture uh, and you can see my little freak out, okay? It's kind of funny. Okay, so uh, assignments have released, two of them, P3 Gold Spike and P3 Project Management. The more interesting one for you is probably the Gold Spike. And it works essentially the same way that it did on your P2 Gold Spike, okay? So your objective is essentially going to be to knock out the most interesting and difficult mechanic in your game uh, in seven days, okay? Work with your team, and maybe you don't know exactly what that mechanic is, but you need to come up to some idea and get that in, okay, and get it working. And then you can change that for future weeks if you if you feel the need, okay? Um, but essentially, uh, you have some team tips. So setting up your uh, uh, GitHub repositories, um, or setting up Collaborate, uh, developing your gold spike, describing what it is, and then submitting that, okay? Uh, so that's not to say this is going to be an easy week. Our expectations for what your gold spike mechanic should be is going to be much higher. You don't have one person working on this project. You have four people. So you have a lot more time to spend uh, to get something neat up and running, okay? So be ambitious. Try something a little bit tricky. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing your ideas. Uh, in their, their very early form, okay? Uh, P3 project management works essentially the same as it has in the past. Uh, sometime tonight, uh, once we actually have your teams completely set uh, and the merging has finished, uh, we will create your projects on the course JIRA. You'll have one person who has access to them and can actually see it. That person will need to go in and add all the other team members to your JIRA project, okay? And then it will show up for you and you'll be able to start working. You're going to want to create a bunch of tasks. So figure out what your gold spike basic mechanic and theme is. Hopefully you've thought about that a little bit already. And you will break that down. You'll create a bunch of tasks and then you'll dole them out to each person. You'll estimate how much time you think they'll need. And that will help you uh, consider, okay, how many tasks can we actually complete for the gold spike? Okay. And uh, that is pretty much how it's going to go from week to week. Okay. Uh, from week to week, you'll have new requirements introduced. Um, uh, so interesting decisions doesn't really matter on this gold spike deliverable, but it will starting next week. Uh, and other things will come into the fray as well. You'll get juice and you'll get theming. You'll get professionalism criteria added to your weekly deliverables as we go on from week to week. Okay. So anyway, uh, look forward to that. It's a pretty simple assignment, and that's essentially it. So it's going to be, I hopefully, a pretty straightforward start to your Project 3. Uh, we will be getting you into your teams. If you don't have a team, don't worry. We will be assigning those teams, uh, uh, you to a team, tonight. And we will send out emails to make sure that you know which team you're on, okay? If you are curious what team you are on and who else is on your team, I believe you can always go to Canvas and then go to the People tab you see on our Canvas site. Uh, and that should give you some information uh, as to who you're working with, okay? Who, who you've been assigned to. Okay, so last time we actually started a lecture on game hacks, cheating, and modability. Um, uh, and I would like to finish that up pretty quickly, okay? We're, we're about halfway done, and we are going to use some cool tools uh, to hack into two games and change some stuff. Remember, this is not for cheating, okay? You are not supposed to be using this in any sort of multiplayer scenario, uh, and you certainly shouldn't be using this to unlock content or something that you'd otherwise have to pay for. Um, so make sure that this is, uh, you're only doing this for your own education to better understand what kind of software is running on your machine and how you can inspect uh, that software, okay? And understand how it works. So let's keep going here, let's load. Come on, come on, let's go. We talked about man in the middle attacks. If you don't know what those is, please watch the previous lecture. It's a very, very interesting um, uh, uh, technological 
issue that we run into, how to defeat those. Ah, don't forget to make my webcam smaller. Thank you. All right, and I think here we go. We want have history, action, replay, RAM. Okay, you control your RAM. So if you're running a game on com on your computer, you really do have control over it, uh, which is a big uh, issue when it comes to porting games to PC, particularly games as a service where security is paramount. Um, okay, uh, so let's take a look at uh, this game, Looney Tunes uh, for the Game Boy Color. Okay. Uh, so Game Boy Color is kind of an interesting handheld. It had a lot of great games. Uh, despite this, you know, it only had two kilobytes of RAM, which makes it even more impressive. Uh, this was in 1999. So the goal for us is going to be look through RAM and find out which ones and zeros correspond to which uh, actual mechanics in the game. So for instance, we're going to look for where our points are stored and where our lives are stored uh, in RAM and see if we can we can figure it out and then edit those, okay? So our approach is this. We're going to scan for values uh, that increase after we gain points in the game, okay? And uh, most emulators and interesting and, and, and uh, debugging tools give you the ability to do this, to scan for values that have changed in some way. We're going to be using the BGB emulator, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do the same thing with a more modern game, okay? Uh, so let's, uh, let's see here. We got 494. There we go. And let's see here, we got the Game Boy Color. Let's see, we'll, we'll launch BGP. Let's talk uh, briefly about user interfaces. If anyone has taken 493, like look at this user interface. Does this blow your mind or what? Uh, this is a user interface where it has no file menu, it has no buttons, it has no options. I thought it was broken until I realized you have to right click to get your actual uh, 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 menu, which is, that is a, that is an, ex an exceptionally unique um, way to do your, your UI, huh? Okay, so let's go ahead and load the game here. Uh, and I think we can do that by just dragging it in. Okay, so we've got our, uh, our game going uh, so that we can study it. So let's go ahead and... We'll, uh, we'll have to wait through our credits here. Okay, so let's get into the gameplay. We'll get into a stage here, and then we'll take a look at what's actually going on under the hood. Okay, so this is kind of the normal gameplay. And let me go ahead and turn the volume down so I can hear myself talk. Here we go. Okay. So here we have the game, right? Your Bugs Bunny, you can run around, you can jump, you can whack stuff, and you can find these little carrots that increase your score, okay? Now, you know, we really want to have the best score in town, right? So we need to figure out where the score is, uh, and we need to go in and change it, okay? Let's see if we can figure it out. So what we'll do is we'll say, hey, emulator, show us the contents of RAM right now. So I think this is here, uh, Cheat Searcher. Okay, now this is a cool little tool that most emulators and tools of the sort will have where it lets you dump the value of RAM at any time, okay? So we know that our score is currently zero. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, grab all of the data, all of our memory addresses, and here they are. Here are all the addresses in RAM right now, okay? Can you see? You might have to squint a little bit because I can't zoom in. But... Uh, here it is, right? Here are all of our addresses and the values at those spaces, okay? Now what we need to do is we need to go in and say, you know what, eliminate every address that doesn't have the value of zero, okay? So keep values which are equal to this value, zero, okay? Uh, and then I believe we click search. Yep, so we've eliminated most of our, val uh, about half of our values. We're down to 15,000 values, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go grab a carrot. So we're gonna grab a carrot, and there we go. Well, we know, we know that somewhere, somewhere in our RAM, a number has gone from zero to something higher than that. Has it gone to 500, which you see in the UI, or has it gone to one, as in you've got one carrot? We don't really know, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to keep all the values that just went up. So we can do that by saying this, keep values which are above the previous value that they had, okay? Oh, all right, we went from 15,000 spaces to 22, okay? But 22 is still too much. So we're gonna grab another carrot, and then we're gonna do the same thing. So keep all values which are above the previous value. Now we're down to four, okay? Now we're going to do something strange. We're gonna say, hey, keep all values which are equal to the previous value. And now we're down to three, okay? So the score, the score is in one of these places, right? Is it 10? Is it two or is it two? Okay, we're gonna change all of these and see what happens. Hopefully we don't crash the game. Okay, we're gonna go here in the debugger. Okay, this opens up uh, the actual uh, game code. Uh, uh, this opens up a RAM and actually shows us the instructions in the game. And it shows us the data as well. So we can see that that 10, right, that's in the UI, we can actually see it's right here, right? And if we can find it, we can actually go in and change it. So let's change this to 99. And then we're just gonna experimentally see what happens. Hey, there we go, we got this big 99 score. So let's look at these other things. Um, can we go in and, and what happens if we change uh, this two uh, to a, oh, I don't know, how about a 50, okay? What happens? Whoa, there we go. It's like our UI is trying to catch up to the fact that we have 50 carats now in the game, okay? So that's kind of interesting. So let's do the same thing, except we're gonna move in the other direction, okay? So let's say that, okay, a score is great and all, but I actually wanna beat the game. This is an extremely hard game and very fun too. Um, so what we're gonna do is we need to have as many lives as we can get our hands on. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go in and um, say, you know what, we're gonna restart this little search here. Gonna restart, hey, restart. And we are going to say, Hey, sorry, Bugs, you need to take a, you're going to jump in the drink here. Okay, we're going to send Bugs Bunny into the drink. Our Whatever value and address was holding our life's counter has decreased, right? So we're going to do that filter. So keep values which are below the previous value to a search, okay? Well, that's down to 171. That's, still, that's not quite good enough. We'll do the equals trick where we say, okay, we haven't died. So keep all values that haven't changed. All right, now we're down to 133. Uh, so let's go ahead and throw bugs into the drink again, see what happens. Hopefully we uh, we can find out the address location before we dunk him too many times. So keep values which are below the previous value. Would you look at that? Wow, we went from 133 addresses to one. So let's go ahead and change this. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and change it to, uh, uh, how about 11? Okay. Hey, look at that. There we go, 11 right there. Um, what's interesting is that you can also go in and, and you can experiment with other values too. So let's go in and change the 11. You know, how about not 11? Let's do, uh, let's do, um, this is hex, right? So let's do, I don't know, how about AB, okay? Congratulations, you now have space heart lives. How, how many is that? What the heck? What happens if we throw ourselves in the drink when we have heart lives? We now have we now have space space lives. Very interesting, huh? <clears throat> so would these memory addresses be different each time you run the game? Um, so sometimes it is. Uh, I think uh, on some platforms it will be. I'm not, I don't think so, I don't think with Game Boy Color though. I think with modern games, for instance, on Windows, every time you restart the game, it does do that. Uh, and part of that is just defense against uh, security defenses. Um, uh, however, what you would end up doing is you'd end up writing a script to do some of this, this searching that we just did to automate that and refine the address every time. Um, that's something that you could do. So anyway, uh, you can go into games, particularly simple games, and you can you can discover essentially how they're working under the hood and how they're running on your own computer, right? Um, because you control the RAM. I mean, because you bought the RAM, right? It's your computer. 
Uh, so it can be a very fun thing to do, but again, do not use this uh, in a way that damages the game or its community, okay? Um, so let's keep going. I want to show you how to do something like this, and this is uh, very risky and kind of difficult uh, demonstration, uh, so if this doesn't work, I apologize. Um, but we're going to do this kind of a similar thing with the fairly modern Street Fighter 4 game. Um, and this is going to be played through Steam, so let's go ahead and find that. Uh, let's do the, um, oh, what is it, Street Fighter 4? Hey, there we are. Okay, so we'll launch the game. Okay, so there we go. And I'm going to probably need to turn the sound down. I've got my controller ready, and I'm going to have to launch the Cheat Engine uh, software, which allows you to inspect RAM and, and better understand what's going on in a given process. <clears throat> so we're going to get the game going. I'm going to have to turn the audio down probably. Come on, Mixer. Hey, there we go. Okay, we'll turn it down so that we can hear. I'm going to press start through here. Uh-oh, captured my cursor. I can't believe NVIDIA bought ARM. Very interesting, interesting times. So we'll go ahead and get into a match here. We're going to get into an arcade mode match. Uh, because what I would like to do is I would like to find a way to keep my health at infinite... Uh, while we play through the arcade mode, which can be quite challenging, even on the easy difficulty, okay? So let's go ahead and, and get that going. We'll get into a match, and then we'll pause it, and I'll show you Cheat Engine, okay? So we get Chun-Li going. We're lagging a little bit. I think it's because I'm recording at the same time here. Oh, wow, that's lagging a ton. Oh, my goodness. I'm not sure why it's lagging like this. Maybe because I have Unity going, but I think it will still work. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to tell Cheat Engine here, which is kind of a general purpose technology for what we just showed. We're going to attach to the game Cheat Engine, uh, go to Street Fighter 4. There we go. We've attached to it. Is the stream doing okay, everyone? Is the stream, it looks like it was a little bit... Hiccupy. Is it doing okay, everyone? It's we're we're good again. Okay, excellent, good. Okay, so we've attached to the Street Fighter Four process. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan. We'll do a first scan, and we'll just get all the values. Oh, actually, I have to I have to tell it what we want. Okay. So I happen to know that our health in this game is represented by two bytes, and it is a value that happens to be smaller than, oh, let's just say 1,500, okay? And this is something I discovered experimentally. Sometimes you have to scan and mess around with these values a little bit. So we're going to scan for all values that are smaller than two bytes in memory right now in the Street Fighter 4 process. So we'll scan and, ooh, ooh. Is that a hundred million addresses we have to search? Well, let's let's hope we can uh, we can get it done. Okay, so let's go ahead and play the game. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some damage. Okay, so we're gonna let this bullet projectile hit us here, and we're gonna pause again. Oh, come on, here, help, help us out, poison. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. CP. There we go. Okay, good. All right. So now we've taken some damage. Our health uh, address has gone down a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another little scan for decreased value, okay? Because we don't know exactly what our HP is, but we know it's gone down, okay? So decreased value, next scan. So now we've gone from 100 million uh, to 95,000 values. So what are we going to do? Well, let's go ahead and take a little bit more damage. We've got a little bit to spare. There we go. We took some more damage. We'll pause again. We'll do this again. So decreased value. Keep all those addresses. We're down to 6,000 now. We're going to keep doing this approach and trying to narrow it down as much as we can. Okay? So we've got damage. Okay, good. So we'll get out of there, and we will do another scan. So decreased value. We're down to 600. Okay? So we'll let the game play a little bit. And then our health did not go down. So what we'll do is we'll do a scan for values that did not change, unchanged value. 
We're down to 105. So let's take a little bit more damage. We're almost there. Okay, we took some more damage. So now we're going to do a decreased value scan. We're down to 24. So this is pretty close. Uh, and I, what I would like to do is I would like to try out... I would like to try out a few of these values. I'm very suspicious. Look at our health. I'm very suspicious of the 630s here. Is anyone else suspicious of those? Let's take a look. We're going to throw those into the bank and we'll actually try them out. So we're going to set our health uh, to uh, 1000. We're going to set both of these values to 1000. Uh, and hopefully we'll see our health go up, okay? Uh, let's see here. Boom. We got it. All right, we got it. So what we want to do now, though, is we can now set our health to be whatever we want it to be, okay? But that's not really what we want. Our what we want. We want to eliminate the ability uh, for you to take damage at all, okay? So our health is restored because we found out where the health is. Now what we can do is we can go in and change the code in RAM uh, because again it is our RAM. Uh, and we can go in and say, hey, uh, let us uh, d -d 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 find out what writes to this address. Because somewhere in our RAM right now is an instruction that causes the value of this address where our health is to change. So let's go in and actually find out, well, let's monitor what causes it to change. So we'll find out what writes to this address, which means we'll attach a debugger to monitor that address. And then we need to take some damage and we'll figure out what is going on. All right, there we go. We just took damage. Now, we've got several different places that write to this address. However, we only got hit once. And so this address right here is very suspicious. Let's go into the code and we'll actually look at it, okay? This is uh, apparently the uh, little place where we took some damage, okay? Uh, so this is the code that I guess is moving some data into that spot. Maybe it's the decreased uh, value of our health. So we'll go in and we'll replace this with a bunch of no ops, a bunch of code uh, that does a whole lot of nothing, all right? And we'll see what happens. Let's take some more damage. We, actually, you know what? Let's do it to the other spot, okay? So we've replaced the code there. Now let's go to the other spot. We're going to find out what writes to this address. Uh, and we'll take some more damage. Help us out here, AI. Come on. Hey, come on. All right. So we took some damage. Now we have our value here. And we can replace this with code that's nothing. We'll show this address in assembler. We've got a subtraction going on here. So we'll go ahead and replace this subtraction with some code that does nothing. And uh, let's take a look. Come on. Hey, let's go. Look at that. We're taking no damage at all whenever we get attacked. So we are now invincible. Okay. So anyway, that is an example of how you can do this to a semi-modern game. right? You can go in and explore how the code actually works on your hardware. And this is something that can help you create your own future content, right? This is kind of what happens when you are uh, looking to do mods and create mods. You figure out where things are in memory, uh, and then often you share that with the community who will create cool content together, all right? Uh, to extend the game, uh, to extend their experience. Not to cheat, though. That is not cool, all right? You should not be doing that or compromising content that the original devs made, okay? So... This game was released in 2019. It requires one gigabyte of RAM. This is a lot more addresses to check than the Game Boy Color, and Cheat Engine was the way we did this. If you go online and look at different modding scenes, uh, sometimes you'll find ROM hacks where uh, uh, players went in and, and, and added new features to a game. Uh, and you'll find that communities have figured out where different things are put in memory. Uh, and this is uh, uh, something that you can do when you're trying to build like a mod loader. Right, so you're trying to build some sort of modding tool for a game or a game engine uh, to allow other people to more easily build mods on top of your, your work, okay? Once you've figured out where everything is. So anyway, there's a lot of value to mods these days. So mods can be seen by companies as a feature, as something that adds value to a product, makes their products more valuable, right? And I, I think this is Bethesda, right? So if you explore Bethesda's uh, various websites for Skyrim and Fallout, you'll find that they have dedicated mod websites and mod marketplaces where you can easily get access to things that change the experience, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, Gary's Mod, right, was a product that was released, a very popular game that was entirely about modding the Source Engine 
and adding new experience uh, uh, and, uh, that you could use characters with, right? Um, there are various websites like Nexus Mods uh, that help you uh, uh, find mods for various games and kind of augment your experience that way. Uh, Mario Fan Games Galaxy uh, is an example of a website and community dedicated to making Mario fan games uh, with the, uh, the games that they bought. So anyway, some mods actually and emulation actually go and they try and meet customer needs, right? So a customer really wants their copy of uh, Super Smash Bros. Melee to be in HD, so they, they'll scrape it off the, the game that they bought uh, and they will add that feature, right? So yeah, HD is out, right? It, it exists for that title. Um, there are other, I won't show it to you, but a really popular version of, um, a very popular variant of mod these days is a randomizer mod where you go uh, and you try to uh, change, uh, or, or you, you make it so that items you find in the game is actually randomized. So you might find an item way earlier than you expect to, or a critical item might be found later than you expect to, making the game much more difficult. Um, uh, AGDQ actually did one of these, where they were playing a randomizer mod, a race uh, between two players uh, with a link to the past, right? So a huge audience watching people essentially play through a randomized version of that game. So a unique experience, very, very interesting and fun to watch, okay? You can get mods as speedrunning tools. Uh, so this is the Resident Evil 3 remake that came out not too long ago. If you look, uh, there's actually, uh, there's this little gadget in the corner. I'll go ahead and get rid of my, uh, my uh, screen here. There's this gadget in the corner that actually shows you what the current health of the player is, what their status is, uh, uh, what their ammo counts, counts are, I believe, what their, the adjusted difficulty is in the game's AI and enemy placement systems. And so this is an example of, hey, someone created a mod that looks at the game's memory locations. They discovered where your health is stored. They discovered where time is stored and where various other statistics are stored. And they're able to get that data out of the game itself uh, and into the stream where viewers can see it. Uh, and it helps uh, make the screen more interesting that way, the stream more interesting. So making our games model, how you, how do you do that? Well, approach number one is do nothing. If your game is popular enough, mods will be created by users who just love your game, okay, eventually. And if you uh, want an example of this, Smashboards is a good example. Um, so another thing you can do that's not too hard is you can sp expose asset files. So Darkest Dungeon is a pretty cool game, uh, and a cool thing that it does is it actually, if you download and purchase this game, you will, uh, you'll find that it actually puts a lot of configuration on your in your file system in very readable formats. I believe they use uh, uh, some sort of form of YAML. Um, anyway, you can go in and you can actually change the starting statistics of a bunch of different classes in this game. And I imagine the developers put that there because they wanted players to have that freedom and uh, expressiveness so they could go and create their own mods, right? Um, another approach is to expose a scripting language. The Binding of Isaac Afterbirth uh, was a game that did this. Uh, they you know, their, their main game engine was written in C++. Um, however, the game logic, right, for enemies and different systems and projectiles and items and attacks and stuff was written in Lua, which is a, a, a kind of a much more friendly and much more simple uh, language uh, than C++. It's, it's fast and small, but it is interpreted. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It is interpreted, uh, so uh, uh, it is uh, very easy to change. Okay, um, the C++ in this game is compiled. It's compiled down to zeros and ones, so it's very hard to mod that, right? It's hard to understand where anything is and how it's all working. However, Lua doesn't get compiled, it gets interpreted. So the Lua code looks like this, right? It's human readable, which means it was specifically coded to be easy for people to modify, right? That's a feature, not a bug, okay? And as a result, the Binding of Isaac has a really, really great uh, uh, modding scene. They have really cool community websites, the Modding of Isaac, where you can uh, find new mods and learn how to create those yourself, okay? Um, so anyway, there's a reference guide and all that. Uh, scripting in Unity games, you know, I'm just going to move through this really quickly. As it turns out, you can dump the code for most Unity games if they don't do some things to obscure it. One of my friends actually, uh, or, some, or not friend necessarily, but someone I know um, went in and... Uh, and uh, 
looked at the code for Yandere Sim, uh, and it was uh, it was not a very pleasant sight. Anyway, uh, more sys uh, scripting systems can be laid on top of Unity C Sharp, such as Python or Lua. Um, so Arbor Interactive games uh, have Lua on top of C Sharp, which is on top of C++, uh, uh, which is the engine that uh, which is the language that Unity engine was written in. Okay. Anyway, uh, for modding, PubSum patterns are really useful because your mods, your modding logic doesn't really need to hook in to any particular or intercept any stu any uh, messages. It just subscribes to uh, certain events, right? So the player created uh, system might ex might uh, generate a player created event, or the player system might create a player created event, and all you have to do is listen for that. Uh, and then, you know, your mod can do whatever custom logic it wants to give the player abilities and power-ups or disadvantages, whatever your mod is supposed to do, okay? Modding is an interesting topic because cloud gaming, it's unclear how it's going to mix with it, right? So Google Stadia, xCloud, uh, Luna that Amazon just announced, uh, Pl PlayStation Now, it's unclear how you mod something when the data is not going to your, your your own machine, right? It's just an image. How do you mod an image, right? So um, it could be a case where modding is not well supported if the future goes to cloud gaming strongly. Um, it could be the case that developers start to explicitly allow you to mod games even if they are streamed. So here's an example. In some of Arbor Interactive games, you can actually go in and uh, they're, they're powered by a spreadsheet. So they download assets from an, uh, a cloud spreadsheet in order to add stuff to their game. So for instance, this is a match three game where we all of the actual icons that you can match are defined in a spreadsheet. You can go in, you can add like a bagel. See, there's no bagel in the game. And then a little bit later, when you reload the game, hey, it is it has, it has bagels now, right? So you could allow a user to provide their own spreadsheet and then even though the game's being streamed, you can allow mods in that fashion, right? So anyway, before we end and move on to maybe more important topics for the day, uh, we will look at a at one of my favorite mods ever. If anyone's played Dark Souls, I think that you will like this, uh, this uh, example, okay? Alright, um, so you get it. It's, it's a really, really fun uh, kind of... It, it really just changes the absolute uh, tone of Dark Souls. It changes the experience a lot. And it's so wonderfully playful and goofy. Um, on the topic of uh, copyright, it's, it is a little bit of a gray area uh, as far as my understanding goes. I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this as gospel. Um, but uh, consider this, right? Like, people take, you know, people draw their own images, their own custom images of copyrighted characters all the time, right? Like they buy a, 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 an art book of Mario and they draw, you know, they draw ears on Mario and they draw cat ears or dog ears or whatever. They, customizing stuff that you own is very, very common, right? You own it, go customize it. I think it gets a lot more complicated when you say, we're going to distribute this, we're going to sell this. Yeah, don't, don't, sell st don't sell this stuff, right? That's, that's definitely very questionable. But again, uh, this is a game you bought running on your machine. And so don't distribute it, but, um, you know, you can, you can learn about what's happening on your machine. That doesn't seem like a problem. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, anyway, okay. The Secret Life of Video Games. 
Uh, so consider this. Modifications are very well known to us in video games, right? They change the way that you experience that art. Um, however, this has been happening in other forms for a long time, right? Uh, so the famous painting, right? Oh, I forget who did this. Um, was, th was this Picasso? Chat, do you know? Was this Picasso? Um, so, right, uh, parody, uh, taking something that exists and messing with it, right, augmenting it to have a different feel, right, adding your twist on it. This happens all the time, in all sorts. This was uh, much, ah, uh, okay. Um, anyway, uh, this happens in paintings, this happens in movies, uh, this happens in all sorts of art forms. Uh, so mods are a way of, uh, of kind of extending the life of a piece of art. Uh, so it's really, really cool. The secret life of, of games, the secret life of paintings, where it continues to live on and morph and evolve and change um, uh, even after the original creators are done with it, okay? Anyway, okay, you don't need to know this stuff. You already know it. Let's move on, okay? That was a bonus lecture. It took a little bit longer uh, than I'd hoped last time, uh, but I hope you enjoy it, okay? And I hope you learn a little bit uh, about how your game actually runs and works on your machine. Okay, let's talk a little bit about efficient teams. This is not, I'll be honest, this is not one of my favorite lectures, and you'll understand why really quickly. It's so new that it doesn't really have a whole lot of visual material and examples in it, uh, but it does have a lot of um, text, and it has a lot of good ideas, so I hope you'll find value in it that way, all right? It seems like, to me, devs don't care so long as you're not directly causing them to lose money, Big recent example is Blizzard waiting to take down many third-party vanilla and WoW services until they knew they were releasing their own vanilla servers. Yeah, it is certainly an interesting dynamic how companies um, decide to handle the situation. Okay? Anyway. All right. So let's talk about effective teamwork. You are now in teams of hopefully, you know, five or four people. And uh, if not, you will be in teams of four or maybe five uh, when you're randomly assigned to them uh, tonight. But there are a bunch of things that could go wrong, and there are a bunch of things to keep in your mind as a team uh, as you move forward, because we've seen a lot of teams as we've been teaching this course for several years now, um, and a lot of issues that tend to spring up. Let's talk about some of those likely issues, okay? And actually, chat, I want to give you a quick moment. Think for a second. You have your team now, right? You're in the honeymoon phase. Oh, this seems like a great team, right? We all have similar interests and we're all, you know, we worked very hard on our P1s and P2s and they came out very well. Oh, it's just a match made in heaven, right? Well, that honeymoon phase will be ending pretty soon. Now, I want to ask you, chat, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, brainstorm reasons why. What could go wrong with your team, okay? And then we'll talk about technical issues that could go wrong and social issues that could go wrong. I think my stream is a little bit delayed, unfortunately. Ah, you all have different expertise. That actually might be a, a very, very big strength. Different versions of Unity. Ooh, that is a big one. Okay, you need to have you need to have the same version of Unity, and I recommend you don't switch unless you have a very big reason to. Merge Hell. Yep, Merge Hell is a big one, right? Uh, you are working on the same thing, and you don't quite realize it. So now you need to choose who will be clobbered and who will get their stuff uh, to stay. Time scheduling, absolutely. So you have incompatible schedules. You can't invest the same amount of time per person or you can't find any time to meet and synchronize. Someone's computer breaks. Merging Unity scenes is a terrible time. So these are all really good examples, uh, but they're all technical. So we'll get beyond those in just a sec. Get merge conflicts. It's got to be number one, right? You probably expected that. Everyone should get their own laboratory scene. Remember in P1, where you had laboratory scenes for each feature, I recommend you actually also create laboratory scenes for each one of your team members, right? And no one touch each other's laboratory, and if someone does, you always, uh, you always take the changes that, that the owner made, right? So you have a lab scene for every person. However, one person 
should be kind of the master of the actual final stages, the final scenes, okay? They control the production scenes and they actually integrate the finished features and prefabs from everyone else, all right? And then maybe you get together to uh, work on level design and stuff or copy and paste cool designs in to the main scene, okay? Um, another thing that can happen is the Git repository poisoning. So this is, you know, you're working for a couple weeks and everything's going well, and then suddenly someone decides to push like, you know, 20 MP3 files, and they don't realize that the MP3 files are like, you know, 1,000 times or maybe more, like many orders of magnitude larger than code files, right? And Git is is built for manipulating code, not big blobs of binary data. So what happens is someone accidentally submits something huge like audio files or several gigabytes worth of models. And now the the repo, like none of your Git functions do anything. They always start, but then they, they stall and you don't know why, right? This is often why. So I recommend that you set up Git LFS before you start doing anything. Set it up this week. Okay, Git LFS is a technology, it's like a plugin for Git, uh, that will automatically force Git to handle big blobs differently. Okay, um, so it will, uh, I, I believe what it does is it, 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 it no longer actually checks through differences in the file itself, but it, it just ch it checks for differences in, I think, a checksum and the uh, pointer. It, it, it just uploads a pointer to that file uh, and tracks the pointer to it instead of the actual file itself. In, in other words, it's, it doesn't even try to treat your big blob audio file like an actual script file where every line needs to be checked. I think that's what happens. Uh, you can look it up if, if, if not. But anyway, set this up so that you don't poison your repo and have it suddenly uh, go unresponsive on you. Okay? Spaghetti code. Coupling and odd, strange interfaces that no one understands, right? This is a huge issue when it comes to working on a team, okay? Your use of design patterns is gonna be more important than ever. You need to standardize and talk with your team about how certain things will be implemented. Why does anyone use standards, okay? Well, standards are really important because they allow different parties to work together, okay? Um, it, I was just looking um, the other day, if you go to the uh, International Space Station, uh, there are actually standards uh, that control like how you need to dock with the International Space Station. Why do they have this standard? Well, a lot of different external parties will want to dock with it. You have the, oh, I forget what the Russian, uh, so the Soyuz, right? You've got the Soyuz rockets and the Russian capsules that are trying to connect. You now have the SpaceX. Falcon 9's heading up and the, um, the Crew Dragon capsules trying to connect, right? And they all need to work with the same International Space Station, and so they need a standard, right? Standards are nice, it tells everyone what to expect and keeps everyone from getting confused. Um, so use design patterns, figure out what your standards are gonna be, and PubSub can make it very easy uh, to use other systems. Observer can as well, okay? Code review can actually be used as well. Uh, to make sure that everyone sort of understands what kind of code and what kind of patterns everyone else is using when they implement features, okay? And there's a little link that we'll provide there. GitHub, I believe, has a way to set up code review for teams working on a project, okay? Question, if we have the student dev pack and can use Unity Collaborate instead of Git with our team, which do you recommend? Um, so Unity Collaborate, to my knowledge, it, uh, it, it gives you three it gives you team sizes of three before it requests money from you. We don't want you paying money in this class if possible. Um, so um, we recommend Git. However, if for some reason you can get Collaborate to work, I believe it uh, is very likely to be very fast. Keep in, keep in mind though that there's also a project size limit when, when it comes to Collaborate. So um, make sure that you are gonna be unlikely to go over that. It is surprisingly easy to get to a project that has over a gigabyte in size, okay? Oh, cool, that's great. Anyway, the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is specialization, okay? So specialization is really, really nice and very, very effective when it comes to teams. So 
there are a few facts here. Our medium term memory is kind of limited and it's kind of expensive, right? It takes a while for us to learn something. And then as we learn other things, it can push us out, right? It can push that earlier memory out. Knowledge acquisition can take a lot of time and that's something we don't really have a lot of in this course. So jack of all trades is not really rewarded when it comes to global competition. And what's interesting, consider this, okay? You, and we'll talk more about this when it gets, comes to the business lecture, but consider this. In the 1800s in Michigan, you didn't need to be the world's best logging company. You just needed to be the best logging company in your small area, right? And often you were the only logging company, right? Because it was super expensive to transport anything and it was very expensive to send stuff over, around. So typically your competition was local, okay? However, we are software engineers. Our medium is information, ones and zeros, bits and bytes. And it is extremely easy and cheap to send those and get those from anywhere on the planet. So in other words, our medium, right, our work is global, okay? Our competition is global in a way that it may not have been 100 years ago, okay? So if you go into this competition with just a jack-of-all-trades skills, you're, you're, you can do a bunch of stuff, but you're not super good at any of it, um, then like you're gonna get wrecked. You're gonna get wrecked by competitors who have specialized, right? You have, your art has to go out and compete with the best indie games, right? Who have a dedicated artist who has been draw, drawing incredible art for years and years, right? So in other words, it really does not help us very much to be super general when it comes to actually putting out a product that competes and works well, right? And wins customers. So the solution here, and that's what we're trying to do, right? We're getting to the point where we want to start putting out stuff that has an impact, not just learning for learning's sake. So the solution here is specialization, right? You might want to consider on your team, okay, who is our DevOps lead? Who's the design lead? Who's going to be in charge of art and the visuals and the overall visual appeal of our game? Who's going to be our playtesting and data tracking lead? Who's going to get us and implement the the tools that track how players do and get us insights to figure out what's going wrong, where our bugs are, where our design issues are. Who's going to be the AI lead if our game needs to have really responsive and interesting and organic AI, right, etc. You know, um, so you know DevOps, right? DevOps, your DevOps lead would be the protector of the development process. So the person who's given most control over the repository accepts and denies pull requests, right? When you have different branches working on different new features, rejects them, and this is very important, rejecting features, delaying them when you're close to a play testing or deliverable deadline. One of the nastiest things that you can do as a team is merge a bunch of new functionality that is untested right before a due date. Because you probably already know this already, um, but when you add new features to a game, they might be working well in isolation, but when you bring them together with other features, they might have integration issues. So that might take you a good amount of bug testing and, and, and uh, bug fixing, right? So it often pays to hold off features for a, a coming build if they don't have enough time to be tested, okay? So it enforces version control policies. So someone who's going to take ownership over you know, forcing people to use lab scenes, um, making sure the repository has Git LFS set up, doesn't get poisoned, right? Hunts down inefficiencies in the dev process. So you're constantly asking people like, hey, you know, where is your time being spent? Can we figure out how to make you more efficient, right? Because that's going to help the entire team. You can have a lead who's going to be all about aesthetics, right? So the protector of the first impression, right? This might be a couple people, a small mini team rather than a certain person, but this person is going to invest time in deciding and researching what the unique art style should be. You know, what's the audio style? How, how is audio going to going to work with the gameplay, right? Um, invest time in juice, in charm, in adding character to your characters, right? Uh, runs experiments with shaders and uh, post-processing, right? To get that perfect feel. Considers things that are likely to be forgotten. So for instance, fonts and color palettes and cinematography, how you move the camera, right? Scene transitions, 
right? A lot of professionalism stuff. You could decide that one person is going to be in charge of most of this. Anyway, you could decide that one person is going to be your design lead because they really love design. They love playing board games uh, and they love thinking about um, how a level can flow, for instance. Now, it might, again, be a team instead of an individual. And everyone is going to contribute to this early on. Um, but this person might invest time in paper prototyping, right? Lots of sketching to communicate their ideas. And uh, yeah, again, here's concept art, right? Concept art for the uh, the Last Jedi, uh, Star Wars, right? Hey, it, it worked, right? Like they had a lot of really beautiful action scenes in that movie that first did not look beautiful, right? But then they handed these ideas off. The professionals understood what the director was going for and uh, they got it done, right? Anyway. Concept art, right? Uh, and this is what it looks like maybe in a game. So I want a character that looks like this. Here it is in its setting, a cave. You're, you've already seen this stuff, right? Characters, you you give the, you show off their mechanics, victory screens, what do those look like? Um, so anyway, design. Those are the finders of the fun. Lots of sketches, thought, thinking about feedback loops, analysis of playtesting data, controls, right? Uh, and prototyping. Okay, cool. So specialization, you should think, maybe even today, about who might want to specialize in the different roles on the team, right? People working to their strengths and really, really understanding their domain, right? You want your team to be greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, and to do that, you need them all to be working and getting really deep in certain topics and then coming together, right? Some notes. When you specialize, you mitigate diffusion of responsibility, okay? If you do something by committee, you know, there's a lot of criticism is often leveled at companies like EA for making games that feel like they're designed by committee. Games that don't really have a specialty, they don't really do anything super well. Um, and a lot of this can come from the fact that, you know what? There isn't just one person in charge of the aesthetics, right? There isn't one person in charge of the aesthetics, so no one really invests themselves wholly in the aesthetics, right? One of the cool things about specialization is if the game sounds really bad, right? If the audio just isn't where it should be, then there is one person that everyone knows is falling behind, right? And because of that, you know, the team knows uh, how to shore up, right? Who to poke and prod to get it going. And the person who's responsible for that area knows what they should be doing, right? It is their responsibility. Uh, the current state is their, their uh, what, what they've sown, right? Their fault, and they need to get going, right? Um, this is not to say, oh, this is a really great video. Passing the buck is super common when responsibilities are shared. And this is a psychological result, not just an anecdote from experience. Let's take a look here. It's a really interesting study on how uh, crowds uh, can be... Uh, trick to the bystander effect. I imagine a lot of you have heard of this before, the bystander effect. When a crowd diffuses responsibility so much that they won't even help someone who is suffering. Let's take a look. Plays like this street in New York City. If you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter uh, is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander uh, apathy, he's pretending uh, to be ill. Help. Help. Uh, How long before he gets help? help? Please, somebody. Help. Help me, sir. Please help me. Helping would be inconvenient or help. even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and help. no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule that we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. 
And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help. And it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You all right? You all right? Yes, thank you. Sure, you look a bit clicky, you know what I mean? She suddenly on, finds sure. herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, you want to sit up? You don't look well, does she? Uh, you all right? Yeah. What's wrong? First I thought she was dead. Then I saw, checked to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right. Six thanks. seconds. <laughs> she even calls him <laughs> sir, and suddenly no, everyone's fine. a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why you're lying on the floor in the rain? Because he's part of the right group. Everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in his position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was OK. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin his suit anyway. <laughs> All right. So it's a, it's, a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty visceral result, right? Uh, surprising in many ways. Sometimes there is not strength in numbers. Um, so the diffusion of responsibility is a very, very real thing. And um, as far as teams go... When you give a certain objective or mission to too many people um, and don't have kind of a, a specialist, right, someone to look to and hold accountable for that mission, uh, then you you can often end in a result where no one's really invested, no one really really owns the result, so, and, and nothing gets done. So anyway, that's another reason why specialization is a, not a bad idea, okay? So uh, a potential issue... Uh, is pride and lack of empathy, right? So critical, it's very, very important that even specialists on your team request help from the larger team when the, it is necessary, okay? Because some of our problems are seriously very difficult, okay? You're going to be doing difficult things on this project in order to make it competitive with other projects out there, okay? And make it a good experience for your players at the showcase. Um, uh, something that can get in the way of us, right? It can block us until it's too late, is this pride and fear of judgment, okay? This idea that, you know, I'm really stuck. You know, Austin told me that I should reach out and get help after like 15 to 30 minutes of being blocked, right? I should go on Piazza, I should talk to my team. But, you know, wait a second, I'm the specialist, right? I'm gonna look really bad. It's gonna, you know, I, I'm, I can't take the embarrassment, right, of reaching out for help. No, 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 that's the worst thing that you can do. You need to reach out for help immediately. Okay, as soon as possible, so that your team knows what the current state of your tasks and objectives are, um, and that so they can start working on interesting novel ideas in the back of their head to potentially help you out. Okay, so solution. The solution to this is to adopt a culture of our instead of my. Okay, it's our AI system. Okay, it's our game. It's not my AI system, my game design idea, right? Okay, it is ours, uh, and all of our work is going to contribute to the whole, right? Our problems and our successes. So instead of his problem or her idea, it's our problem, it's our idea. When you start thinking of, of it in that more collective sense, it becomes much easier to reach out, right? Well, I better reach out, otherwise, you know, my indecision, my lack of movement is going to hurt our team, right? Our AI system is suffering uh, so I, I need to reach out, okay, because it's really our problem. Okay, so specialization, some extra notes. You have a leads, okay, 
You'll probably have leads, but you won't have gods, okay, or kings or queens. Some successful teams are led by gods, but most are not. One that comes to mind is Hideo Kojima, uh, who has a, oh, is this going to be the, the crazy walk-in that he did? Okay, so some people are so famous and so powerful uh, that they can basically just control the entire darn team. And you just do what they say. You literally just do what they say. And that's it, right? You implement their design. And if they tell you to do something else, you just do it, right? But you have to be this level of famous to make that happen. Great. <laughs> Okay, so unless you're so famous that Sony is making a magic digital carpet uh, appear in front of you, uh, then you, yeah, you, you're not, uh, your team is full of leads and not gods, okay? All right, let's keep going. So that is to say everyone on your team should be comfortable and you need to create a culture of people giving feedback and being comfortable about that on every topic, even if it's not your specialty. There's no reason the person in charge of the AI system shouldn't have a say on whether or not your aesthetic approach is working, right? Your team's aesthetic approach is working. Um, so you need to create that, that comfort, okay? Consensus should still rule even though you do have specialized lead. Hey, if you've got a lead who is making this AI system and spending a ton of time on it, and the AI just, it, it's not really a good fit for this game design we're going for, right? The team should overrule them. They should say, you know what? It's just not working out. Like maybe we should assign Maybe your mission should be something else. Maybe we assign you to the UI because our, our game is really UI heavy and not so AI heavy, right? So consensus still needs the rule. Um, I'm just like, why did he talk so fast he ruined it? I was thinking the same thing. Did I talk super fast, chat? I'm not really sure what that's a reference to. Anyway, um, leads should make the case to their teams, okay? If you are uh, specializing in the aesthetics of your game, you need to go sell your team on your vision for the aesthetics, all right? Okay, almost like having external stakeholders, leads, other leads that aren't necessarily responsible for the mission design or the design of your game, they'll be a little bit more impartial, right? Uh, they are not invested so much in that portion of the project that you own, uh, and so they will give you better feedback. We just got to listen, okay? Oh, yes, why did he walk so fast? Yeah, Hideo walked too fast. He outpaced his digital carpet, which is a, a shame. It didn't look very good. He kind of disappeared into the, the floor as a result. Anyway, let's talk about some tools, okay? And this is just more of a practical matter. You have the problem on a team of four or five of knowledge sharing, okay? This is a slow thing to do. Explaining an idea to someone else Explaining a bug to someone else, transferring information from one brain to another is an extremely inefficient process. That's why you have specialized people who are trained to do that, like your teachers or profs, right? Uh, they have to send a bunch of knowledge from their brain uh, to uh, a bunch of other brains as fast as possible. Um, so it happens, knowledge sharing is going to happen hundreds of times per day, okay, uh, with your teammates. And as a result, it is worth making a large upfront investment to get even a tiny boost in productivity. It's going to be worth it, okay? Here's your solution. If you haven't installed and, and normalized ShareX or something like Monosnap on your team, you got to make sure everyone has that installed. You should not get a bug report for someone that's only text. You should always get a little video or a screenshot or a GIF or something like that. And it's extremely fast to create those things and share them if you all set up ShareX or Monostep properly, all right? Free and open source, the expected ramp up time is just 30 to 45 minutes and it's gonna be a big win for you and your team. Make sure you, that you have a Discord or Slack set up so that you can very easily just dump stuff uh, as you work on it into those channels and get feedback ultra fast, okay? Um, when it comes to in-person, though you're really not gonna be doing a lot of that this semester, right? This is more like for a normal semester. Um, However, you want it to be low friction, you want it to happen quickly, doodle, right? When is good? Google Calendar, okay? You need consensus on something, you need a vote, go create a quick doodle. Um, you need to know when you can meet, right? When you have time to work together, use when is good, use Google Calendar. 
What I recommend is that you set up, just allocate a recurring guaranteed slot of time where everyone on the team will be in the same Discord server channel, no matter if they have something to work on or not, okay? This will help keep you close as a team and connected and make sure you understand each other's status and their progress and, um, and, 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 and challenges, right? It'll keep you together even though you are far apart physically, chances are, okay? So determine recruiting meeting up times. Uh, consider meeting in pairs if all five or four of you cannot make it. In Google Calendar, you can actually set up notifications, create a calendar, and then set up notifications for your events so that everyone gets a, a, a an SMS, they get an email and a notification reminding people, hey, you need to show up, right? It's time. Anyway, uh, make sure you have a Google Calendar. Make sure you're planning out your time so you can find little blocks in it where, okay, I've got an hour here, i got two hours here. If I shift this to here, I've got a bigger continuous block for our work, right? So make sure you're doing that stuff. Be very, very thoughtful as a team about the process and you'll have a good product, okay? How to determine leads, right? Oh, we got a question. How often do you recommend meeting synchronously as opposed to working asynchronously? Um, so what I recommend is you want to allocate dedicated time that's like routine, right? Because you'll be more efficient if you can get into a routine and you'll be more efficient if you can bounce ideas off of your teammates really quickly and potentially screen share and stuff like that. So what I recommend is, you know, have, try and have a meeting, right? Even if it's relatively short, like every day or sorry, every other day. And maybe you have a dedicated, like substantial three or four hour block to work together as a team on the weekends. You know, a lot of teams, what they'll do is they usually get feedback I think they usually get feedback about Wednesday or Thursday after submitting on Monday. And that they usually have like a nice big block of time scheduled so that they can they can watch the feedback together. They can create a bunch of new tasks and set those tasks in motion with some basic initial work. And then once everyone knows what's going on on and why they're working on the things that they're doing, then they go asynchronous for a couple days, they meet again, and then they go asynchronous for a few days and then have a big block scheduled like Sunday evening where they can all play test the game, fix any final bugs, merge anything that needs to go in and, uh, and do, the, do a, a submission and do it right and check the submission, okay, to make sure what was submitted meets all the requirements, okay? Um, that, is, that is what I recommend and what seems to work really well, okay? So question, how can you determine leads? How can you solve problems? Um, uh, between the team, right? Especially if you have a team of four and voting is hard. One technique is blind voting. So each member of the team is going to rank each other member for a given role. You write anonymously on a piece of paper, you throw them into a hat, and you're encouraged to rank yourself as, as rank four, right? Um, uh, because, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, you might not rank yourself and it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing, right? Everyone is encouraged to be selfish because that just takes it out of the equation. You then sum up the rank for each person, you reveal the winner. And that's only what you reveal. You don't reveal who voted for who. They get that job, okay? So some questions. Teams, what can go wrong outside of a technical perspective? And then we'll take a break, okay? And then we'll move on to SIMD. Miscommunication, right? This is the single biggest issue. This is the reason why relationships break down, okay? People don't understand each other because they don't interact much. If they don't understand each other, they can't empathize e with each other, which means they can't help each other. If they don't help each other, they don't feel like teammates. They don't feel like everyone's invested. They feel alone. If they feel alone, animosity builds. Well, if I'm alone, you know, why are these other people, you know, um, uh, just freeloading off of all my work, right? You don't see what work they're doing. You feel alone, and then it just all falls apart. Suddenly, you are much less than the sum of your parts, much less. Okay. In fact, you might even be less than the sum of one of your parts uh, because people are not having a good time working. They don't like each other. They feel antsy. They're anxious all the time. You know, talking to their teammates is a drag. It's, it's, uh, it's just a nasty, nasty situation. And you've all probably felt this before. Okay. So critical is communication. You have to find a way to keep it going and you have to find a way to understand what each other is going through and where their strengths and weaknesses and temporary challenges lie, okay? Power struggle is another issue, right? 
where people are just very prideful. Like, this is my game. This is my dream. This is my game design. This is my chance, right? And you're not going to get in the way of my one chance at getting into the game industry, <sighs> right? And so they, they start pushing people around and start discounting other people's opinions and start discarding popular vote, start doing their own things and disregarding the group. Power struggle is really bad. Um, and part of getting past this and eliminating this as a possibility is instilling a culture of it's our game, okay? It's our game. It's not any one person's game. And this is not going to be our dream game. It's not going to be our final game, okay? We have a long life to live. And, you know, this game is not going to be the thing that gets us a job or keeps us out of the industry forever or kills our dreams, okay? Uh, there are, it's my sleepover and I get to choose the game we make. That's right. So, Anyway, keep in mind that as important as this game is in the course and for your grade, and as, as good as this can be as a portfolio piece, if the game does go well, it's not the end of the world. This is not going to be the last game you make if you really want to make games. Um, so share. Please share your ownership and, and, and go into it. Don't go into it with a dream. Do not go into this project with an idea of, okay, how do I, how do I politic my group into making this game that I have in my head. Don't do that. This is an exploration. Okay. You work with your team selflessly uh, to discover something that is even better than any ideas you currently have. Okay. So anyway, freeloading, freeloading is an issue. You know, it's an issue where you hop onto a team and you're working hard, but you notice the level, the same level of investment just isn't there. Right. So you've got people who think that they can get a good grade in this course uh, by investing substantially less time than their teammates. For those people, if you notice those people on your team, inform them that we are auditing, we are checking your log sheets, and you will be losing a lot of points, a lot of points, like a, 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 a uh, course-failing, you know, endangering amount of points um, if you do not keep up with your teammates, at least to the average of your teammates, okay? Uh, and I'm not talking, you, you, you know, as long as you're, within the ballpark of what your teammates are doing um, on average. You, you should be okay. But anyway, freeloading is a big issue. Do not be that person. And if you have that person on your team, talk to them with your other teammates and explain to them what corp course policies will do if they do not want to invest at a similar rate, okay? Um, control freak, right? You don't want control freaks, failed delegation. You know, you need to be not afraid of handing off tasks to other people. Trust them right? And if you can't trust them because they're not delivering, then you need as a team to go in and, and, and find out why someone's being inefficient, you know, what struggles are they having? Maybe we need to, to, to take some of their tasks and offload it because they're going through a rough period and they'll be better soon, right? That's all some stuff that happens, right? People, there are many reasons why someone might not be able to contribute very well to a project at a given time. So please have empathy as a team and Make their burden lighter, shift burdens around uh, as the project goes on, as people come online, as they go offline, do the various issues. It's a very tough semester. So have as much empathy as you can. You'll be all right. You'll stay efficient and people will come in and, and be, be heroes when they need to be. And they'll step back and recover and power them, themselves up when they need to. Okay. Poor talent usage. If you've got someone on your project who really, really loves graphics, Oh boy, it would be it would be a real missed opportunity to assign them to AI, right? Um, so please learn about each other, uh, figure out who you know where everyone's interests and strengths lie, and then work to those interests. This doesn't mean you silo someone off completely, right? Hey, you can only work on art, you can only work on AI, but you want to play to your strengths, you know, as much as possible. Okay. So, and the biggest one also is remote apathy. Being separated by distance is a huge deal, right? It causes diffusion of responsibility. It causes people to not feel a part of the team, which means they won't contribute as well, which means your entire game uh, and, and, and end results will be subpar. Um, so do whatever it takes to stay in touch. Get those meetings scheduled where you just kind of hang out and have fun. Listen to some music together. Um, I don't know, maybe have a movie night or something where you all watch a movie at the same time and, and make fun of it, right? Find a cheesy horror flick. Uh, uh, build those relationships. It'll help out a lot. All right. So communicate. Blah, 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 blah. Of course, probably overwrote them. Uh, okay. There you go. Okay. This is this is something that I want to go by uh, 
our it is our game <laughs> our game comrade yes um uh, we're doing this. You aren't invited to my birthday. Yay, everyone happy. So presenting as a team, this is something you'll never have to do in this course until maybe the final showcase, but probably not. Um, this is just something that's useful for real life, okay? When you're presenting as a team, and this is just kind of a fun tangent to talk about, okay, team presentations. Create a next slide signal. You know, if you're not presenting, focus on the speaker, don't move. There's something deeply wrong with this image, okay? What is wrong with this image? When you look up here, you see a bunch of faces. Humans are drawn kind of instinctively to other faces, okay? Um, by the way, there's one other species that is drawn instinctively to the human face. Does anyone know what that species is? From birth. Chat. Chat, what other species is drawn to human faces from birth? It's the most adorable answer you can imagine. Bingo, MK Wiz with, with the quick solution. Yes, Frank or Z's in the chat, our best friend, the canine. Uh, they are, uh, apparently they've evolved from, from their wolf ancestry uh, to uh, essentially see a human face. So, so when babies are born, right, Human babies, they kind of instinctively uh, like to see their mother's face, and, and it's not too hard to imagine why, right? That is their key to survival. Um, uh, but puppies see a human face, and they, they have the same reaction. So it's really, really cool. Anyway, uh, that's, that speaks to how our relationship as a species, uh, as two species, has, has developed. I was, lo I was looking at the R awe. Go to the Discord server if you want to see the cutest uh, kitty uh, get a video you've ever seen in your life. All right. Um, anyway, so one really nasty thing about what this team is doing, right? Two teammates are doing a really good thing. You've got one speaker who's the focus of attention, delivering the knowledge. You have two people who are up here and they're standing in kind of an awkward spot, but they're redirecting everyone's attention to the speaker. That's good. That's a good thing. You've got this person who looks like they're thinking about, oh, how did I end up you know, oh, geez, is my refrigerator running, right? Oh, my gosh, is uh, how did I end up here? Why did my life come to this, right? You just, you see this person and you just wonder what they're thinking. That is a distraction for an audience that is not good. Okay, so this is working properly. You've got two, three faces up here. They will all attract attention. These faces redirect the attention to this person who's presenting. That is good, okay? Um, this is not a good example. Uh, we have our speaker here who's trying to deliver knowledge. However, her teammate is the far more interesting face because you look at her face and you cannot help but wonder what is off to the right side of the screen here uh, that is uh, taking her attention. So you might look over your shoulder. Has someone entered the room, right? Anyway, uh, here is Brent Musburger and I forget his name. He's an Ohio State guy, it's okay. And uh, this is Marshall Mathers, uh, also known as Eminem, okay? And so what you'll notice is that these two are professionals. They are trained to redirect attention to the whoever is speaking at the time. And they do that. However, uh, Eminem is blowing this up big time. And you'll see in just a second what this means. To introduce Marshall Mathers. Some of you may know him as Eminem, but he's gonna join the Saturday night crew with our music intro starting next Saturday night. But folks, I wanna take you to the world premiere of one of his new videos called Berserk. Take a listen. It's headed for the top of the charts. Rick Rubin, who was uh, helping produce that with you, uh, Marshall, when you did that. Yeah, sorry. Live <laughs> TV. <laughs> Live TV freaks me out a little bit. No. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah. That is, that is uh, I, I, I remember it being just hilarious when that happened live during the Notre Dame-Michigan game. And um, uh, what's interesting in here is that uh, Brent, uh, uh, sorry, who's this guy? I, this guy right here, I forget his name, is, is redirecting attention to Brent, who is speaking over here, right? However, he notices what Eminem is doing and that he's essentially making this the most awkward conversation ever. So he starts to laugh at the camera, but then focuses back on Brett Musburger to essentially break the ice and make it less awkward. Um, and uh, uh, so, but when you watch this clip, you are not paying any attention to the person who's speaking and trying to give you some knowledge, right? You're paying attention to Eminem, who is uh, sabotaging this so hard because his face is the most interesting thing here. Anyway, that's just a fun little thing. Uh, Kirk Herbstreet, yes, I've forgotten, okay? Uh, another example of this is the famous Silent Hill Stare, 
where you've got this person presenting at I think E3 or GDC, I, I don't quite recall, and his uh, his colleague behind him is staring at him, redirecting attention, but he's staring in such a fashion and in such a position and with, with such an emotion uh, that he, he it just steals all the attention away immediately. Okay, let's take a look. That's what Ishwar, that's what Mary, uh, 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 our, our former uh, president, um, uh, Coleman, uh, said when she made an interesting speech during a Michigan football game. Well, I, don't, I don't know if anyone bought it. Horror games are meant to be, so we're borrowing influences from what the uh, successfully executed in the past. The disturbing creatures, the mind-boggling, the mind-bending psychology that transports players to an alternative nightmare world. And in the process, involving our core combat in a logical direction as opposed to just increasing... If you just... Okay. So anyway, that little clip right there also shows the value of music and the value of a nice camera zoom and cinematography too. Um, so okay, let's go ahead and take a break, oh boy. And then we're just gonna get into the very beginning. I'm just going to whet your appetite for the SIMD lecture, okay? Uh, the uh, single instruction, multiple data, or in other words, um, why and how a GPU works and how you can create your own interesting screen effects by programming in kind of a different way than you're used to, okay? And we'll do the demonstration next time. Let's give it about five minutes, okay? Go to the bathroom, we'll turn on some music. Um, let me know, team, if you, if you uh, know what music this game is from. This might be a hard one, this is obscure. And ask any questions you might have, okay? Yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so the really good question. How did the sim devs feel about mods? Um, I, my understanding from when I was there was that they really loved mods uh, and that they they kind of switched to a, um, they switched to a, a scripting language in order to essentially make that a little bit easier for, for mods to happen. Um, and there was, I believe, if I recall, there was some debate over whether we should release our internal tools uh, to make modding even easier still. However, I don't think, while the devs might have liked it, I think there's a, a business case for not doing that, right? Uh, a big part of the Sims business model is creating um, new content and releasing content packs. Uh, and so, uh, you know, creating competition from the community for your own, like, main business model is, eh, I can understand why they maybe didn't want to make it super easy to do that. Um, and certainly not super easy to distribute mods. So good. I, I wish this game had sold more copies. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I okay. Hold on a second. If you use the the, spe, the better Twitch TV, the that icon should still be available. Fox killer.
That's that's the tired. That's the sleeping. Uh, emoji. That is not the correct. That is not the correct thing to post right now. This is not the time to be tired and sleeping. That is not. I'll wait a second. That is not. Here it is. Hey, you are correct. That is Worms 3D. Okay, let's get to it. I want to get a let. Le I don't think we can get to the demonstration part of this lecture, but it's still it's a fun topic to talk about, and I'm glad I'll get to remind you over the course of several days about SIMD and aesthetics and graphics. So let's talk a little bit about shaders. Okay, it is a topic. So, uh, question chat: Who has experience writing shaders, or who knows what I'm saying when I say SIMD? Right. This is a way of programming and a topic that is really not covered very heavily at Michigan unless I imagine you take the new GPU course, which is it's very exciting that we now have one. Um, Ishwar, you don't count, my dude. Sorry. Yeah, um, so it is something that's fairly rare, right? And you, uh, chances are you have not programmed in this way before if most of your programming has just been done through Michigan courses and maybe an internship, a non-game dev internship or two, okay? So look at this screenshot right here. This is actually one of the uh, more fun bosses from Super Mario Odyssey, right? It's this very, very cool kind of Aztec style statue. And this boss, they really wanted this boss to be intimidating. So when it shows up, it does this quick animation and does this pound, right? Um, part of the way this boss attacks you is by pounding the ground and smashing you. And so what the devs did was they created this really impactful effect. It, if you watch this, it just feels like you can do, you, you feel the energy of this hit, right? And so if you really stop it though and look at what it's doing, it there's this kind of, there's this blur that happens that is directed toward a point around the middle of the face, the nose kind of area. Uh, and everything else is blurred, especially toward the side of the screen. Look out here, right? Even the particles flying are blurred. And so the question is, how do you create something like this? Because, I mean, you couldn't, or, I mean, we don't really know how to do that with what we know already, right? Um, even post-processing stuff, the basic stuff that I showed you a few days ago, wouldn't really work. I mean, this isn't really Bloom that's, that's being used, is it? 
Uh, this isn't even motion blur that's being used. It's a totally kind of unique blur that's focused on a particular point of the screen. And it fades out over time too, so it's really cool. Um, so as it turns out, you can write your own shaders in Unity that run on your GPU and will give you interesting graphical effects like this, right? We've got this heat wave. Well, as it turns out, this is a pretty simple effect to write. You could write it yourself in probably about two minutes if you knew exactly what to do. Um, and there are other examples too, like a screen Im uh, a, uh, a, an image shader, uh, a screen image shader could be used to write a little a scene transition. If you go into our course repository, you'll find this. Okay. Um, first of all, if you look at the bottom of this, oh, oh, look at this. Look, cool. It's like a shape, right? So in your scene transition, it, it shows a silhouette of a shape uh, as you fade in and out. And if you look at the very bottom, if you look at the button when it gets clicked, there's actually this cool wave effect, right? Where you click the screen and the screen acts like it was water you just clicked. So you get this ripple. It's pretty darn cool. Um, anyway, uh, there are other things you could do. Right, So if you happen to be making a firefighting game, which I was a little while ago. We're still working on it. It's not totally dead yet. Okay, how do you implement water? Well, you can use shaders to implement water with something as simple as a ball pit model. Okay, So this is what's going on under the hood. It's just a bunch of spheres bouncing and rolling around with low friction. And we render them using a, a shader to look like water. So anyway, uh, da, 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 da. so blah, 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 blah. Can, I, can I find the cool things to show you about shaders? Water iteration, right? This is the water we started with in our project, literally just a ball pit, right? A bunch of blue balls uh, bouncing around. Hey, that's your water. Go, go for it. And we wanted something more like this, uh, which was uh, from the Pixel Junk series, Pixel Junk uh, Shooter, I think. And so we started working. We actually, um, what we did was we said, hey, let's take the positions of these balls, let's put them into the shader, and let's use that in a thresholding function to tell the pixels in that area that they should just render as these blue spheres. And if the threshold is small enough, we actually render uh, the outline, okay? And that worked pretty well, and we made it more efficient so we could fill an entire room with water. And then eventually we got to the point where we can actually spray water around, have quite a few pellets, and we can actually do this really cool um, effect where the water actually kind of flows downhill. Um, and hopefully, come on, can we can we can we play it here? No. Come on, let's go, let's go. We're on the clock here. We got seven minutes. Okay, so we got this firefighting kind of prototype game, so you can run around as a firefighter. If you're a firefighter, you need water, right? You gotta have good water in your firefighting game. So we have water here, and you shoot it up, and it flows down, and we right? And uh, as it turns out, it actually has water physics, so you can bunch it up, and you can actually run through it to get it to pile up, and you can affect waves and stuff by jumping around in it. Splash, jump around, there you go. Whoosh, whoosh, right? Yeah. Eventually, I'm going to return to this game, and we'll finish it up and make it a, a, a fun platformer and sell it, uh, because that water is pretty cool. Anyway, you can do other stuff, too. You can do smoke with shaders. Uh, I believe you can see some of that here, right right down here. Uh, this is using a stencil shader so that the particles don't render as the particles themselves. The particles render a moving, a constantly moving big texture behind the particles. Okay, that's why the particles look like smoke, uh, a cohesive kind of batch of smoke, even though they're distinct particles. Anyway, enough of this. Let's get back to it. Okay, so you get the message, right? You can do a lot of stuff with shaders, okay? And the question is, well, how do you do stuff with shaders? And, how, and, and what you'll find is that this is very, very hard and difficult and new, scary programming to do. And really, it just takes a lot of practice, right? It'll, it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of experimentation and you will get very comfortable with it and you will enjoy it, okay? This is one of my favorite comics. How do you draw so well? Practice. It must be an innate gift, a gift from God. It's practice. I'll never understand how some people are so talented. It is a mystery. No, it is a lot of practice, okay? So don't be afraid. Uh, just do it, as Nike would say. Okay, so I have a challenge for you. All right, I have a challenge for all of you. Your challenge 
is to get your deck painted. Okay? Chat, how are you going to do it? You got to get your, your deck painted. Okay? And here are your options. Okay? You have two options to get your deck painted. First, you're going to hire someone in town. This is the Captain Painter Ultimate. This is like Master Chief, but he's painting. Okay? My Master Chief with burnt papers. He is so good at painting that he can run super fast. He's got a great brush. You know, he is, he is so incredible at overcoming any painting challenge. Okay? Very flexible. He can do anything you ask him. Okay? Your other option is to hire not one person in town, but a team. Okay? This is the group painting unit. These are a bunch of soldiers. They move very slowly. They're not even remotely as good at painting as Master Chief, but there are a lot of them, and they're very cheap, okay? And so, you can hire your super soldier painter, or you can hire this team of much slower painters, okay? One soldier, or you hire 1,280 uh, uh, soldiers, okay? And the question, chat, is what do you do? What do you do, chat? What's the play? Okay, so let's keep going. Here's the question. Which one is going to be faster? Which one is going to be faster? And let me just zoom in here so you can actually see the darn screen. Which one do you think is going to be faster? Everyone in the chat is saying Master Chief, okay, instead of the group painting unit. Okay, I have another challenge for you, chat. Before I tell you the answer to this one, I've got another challenge for you. You are lost in a hedge maze. Okay, and you make the phone call, and the last two people you called were, you know, Master Chief, the Captain Painter Ultimate, or the Group Painting Unit, okay? And the question is, who of these two groups are you going to call to come bail you out of the maze? They have to go through this maze, and it's really thin and tight, right? And you have to remember where you've been, and, oh, here's the thing, by the way, here's the thing. This Group Painter Unit, they can't separate, they have to march together, okay? They have to march together. They have to stay in lockstep because they are a disciplined, like, soldier corps, right? So they have to march when each other marches. When one person bends down to paint, they have to all bend down to paint. They can't separate, okay? Who are you going to call to get you out of this maze? Chat, who are you going to do? 1280 people is a lot of people to pay. But keep in mind... They cannot separate, so they all have to squeeze into all these paces, and they have to explore each nook and cranny at the same time, okay? So I'm seeing a lot of chief in here, okay? Frankly, I'm, chief is just getting a lot, of, a lot of love in general, so we'll have to see, okay? But let's drop the act, all right? So over here, we have Captain Painter Ultimate. You might even say CPU for short. And this is one soldier that is super fast and super flexible and very self-sufficient. They can do any darn thing you ask, really. And they're going to be pretty good at it. And then over here, you have the group painting unit. You might also uh, call that GPU for short, right? Just to be efficient here. They are fairly slow, right? And they only move in lockstep. They're not very flexible at all, but there's so darn many of them that sometimes they can be very useful. Okay, of course, when I ask which one is the faster one, I'm really talking about your CPU and I'm talking about your GPU, okay? Did anyone see this coming? Maybe I just blew your mind, okay? I, uh, unfortunately, I've lost my GPU. I used to have a CPU that I pulled out of an old computer. I still have the GPU though, all right? So this is the GPU from the main Arbor Interactive uh, computer over there. So it's not much work being done today, I guess. Um, the CPU that you see right here is like this big, okay? It's like this, this big, okay? Compared to the GPU, which is this big. This actually makes some sense, though, because whereas your CPU might really only have one core or have may have more like eight cores or something like that, this might have way more. It might have 1280 cores. It might have many more cores, okay? But they're tiny and they're cheap and they're all packaged in here to work together, okay? So... Anyway, uh, this is not a Bitcoin miner. It's a uh, Gigabyte NVIDIA uh, 1060 GTX. GTX 1060, okay? So uh, there you go. Anyway, 
So one core versus 1280 cores that are much cheaper. Okay, and let me go ahead and minimize. Okay. Anyway, when it comes to painting a a a, a dock, or when it comes to you know when when we say paint dock, right? When I say your challenge is to is to paint your your uh, your uh, your what did I call this? Your dock. I'm just gonna keep calling it dock. Your deck. When you paint your deck, what I was really talking about was painting your screen. Okay. And so what happens is um. Okay, what happened is something called Moore's Law, all right? So processors, CPUs, were getting faster and faster and faster every couple of years until they really stopped, all right? Moore's Law just kind of petered out, right? We keep adding more technology and more transi transistors to our single processors, our CPUs, but they're not really getting all that much more effective, right? You know, every processor that you look at these days will be in that kind of four to five uh, 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 gigahertz, megahertz? Is that really right? Uh, gigahertz uh, frequency. So anyway, when it comes to processors that need to do like a really intricate and difficult task and need to be really flexible and need to remember stuff, um, they are really good for stuff like maze searches, okay? Like AI, um, you know, finding, pathfinding. They're really great for that. But GPUs are really, really great for doing rendering, Okay, because if you think about rendering, all it really is is each pixel deciding what color it needs to be and then just painting that pixel. That's it, really. And so, for instance, you could have that group rendering unit. All those pixels, they just sit, you know, they just kind of bend down and they just paint wherever they're standing and then they're done, right? They all do one painting and then they're done. So here's a challenge for you. Paint your screen during gameplay, okay? And I'm gonna provide some code for you, okay? So here's the code. So if you look up here, here's how a CPU, a single instruction, single data processor would paint your screen, okay? So we've got this 2D array of pixels. So we're gonna have two for loops. We're gonna go uh, width first, 1920 by 1080. Um, and what we'll do is we'll do a quick lookup, right? We'll do a lookup operation on our texture. So we'll say, hey, give us the color of our texture that we need to paint to the screen at coordinate I, coordinate J, okay? And then we just simply paint that color to that coordinate, right? Pretty simple. However, we need to do a bunch of operations, okay? How many paint operations occur? Chat, ask yourself this. How many paint operations occur when our CPU is sprinting through every darn pixel? Blah, 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 Actually, it's more like it's in doing all of these different paint operations. It is 1920 times 1080. That's a lot of operations, and we got to do that every single frame of our game. So 60 times per second. Okay. Oh, that you know, CPUs are fast, but they're not that fast. All right. So that's a lot of operations. We really wish we had some better way to do it. What if we could just paint everything in one operation? What if we could do that? That'd be pretty sweet. So here's how we can do it with a GPU. Here's what it's like on a GPU, okay? So here's how it looks like. The GPU, every single pixel executes this function, okay? But every single pixel gets a different value for X and a different value for Y because these pixels are at different X positions and different Y positions, right? And so what each pixel does at the exact same time is it just says, hey, I'm at X, I'm at Y, my data, right, multiple data, my data is different from my neighbor's data, and my X is 1, my Y is 1, my neighbor's X is 2, their Y is 1, okay? So I'll take my X and I'll take my Y, right, because we have multiple data, but we have single instructions. So I'll take my X and my Y, I'll look up the texture and I'll just paint it. And what happens is that this bit of logic runs on every single pixel, 1920 times 1080, right? Over 2 million pixels at the exact same time, okay? And they're all running the same instruction, single instruction, but they all have slightly different data, multiple data, okay? 
X and Y is different for each pixel, but they more or less run the exact same logic. And oh, I'm too big, aren't I? And this is how your GPU essentially manages to move so fast. Um, you have a bunch of really dumb, you know, pretty inflexible CPU cores that are also really cheap. And they're not very fast. However, they all run the same basic instructions at the exact same time. And so they can get the job done extraordinarily quickly. Okay? This is massive parallelization that just absolutely takes this problem and just cleans it out. Okay? Cleans its clock. The CPU has to run around like crazy to every pixel to paint it all. The GPU, hey, everyone gets their own pixel to handle. You handle your pixel. In aggregate, collectively, we finish the problem way faster than that super CPU running around. Thinks he's all tough. It's crazy, right? Anyway, that's the uh, basic kind of idea behind SIMD. Yeah, sorry, uh, SISD, single instruction, single data, the way we're used to programming, and SIMD, right? Single instruction, multiple data. In other words, in order to write shaders that manipulate the pixels on our screen, image shaders, we need to be able to write code that is going to work the same for every single pixel, but with slightly different data, slightly different inputs coming in, okay? It's a little bit awkward, but I'll show you how this, uh, how this goes. So instead of 2 million paint instructions, we have one paint instruction happening, but just happening a little bit slower, right? So anyway, um, yeah, we'll skip this. You can come back and you can actually look at the code that runs this, um, this image right now. This, actual, this screen transition is a bunch of pixels working together to say, should I be on or should I be off based on what this image uh, is, okay? Okay, so anyway, to excite and whet your appetite for our demonstration happening uh, on Wednesday, vertex shaders, right? You, you don't only have to write shaders that manipulate uh, pixels. You can write shaders that actually manipulate vertices, vertices being the kind of points that make up a 3D mesh. And if you can control that mesh, you can make it do all sorts of crazy things. You can generate additional geometry with your shaders as well. So anyway, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, uh, a bunch of this stuff, how to implement some of these uh, next time. We're going to implement essentially this underwater shader, okay? And it shouldn't take too long. We can move on to other stuff. I'm going to be around for about 10 minutes, everyone. I apologize for going overboard. I got too excited. Um, but uh, we will hang around for about 10 minutes, me and my GPU here, uh, and we will answer any of your questions. We'll throw some music on, all right? Otherwise, uh, get going on your P3 Gold Spike. Do not delay. Uh, start working with your team. Start thinking about what kind of tasks you should create and distribute. Uh, and um, we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank you for joining us, and please stay safe, okay? Have a good one. I'm going to throw this into the schedule. Oh, this is going to get me us delisted from YouTube. Hold on. Yeah, YouTube does not like when I play that one. There we go. If we have three people for a team, how do we request just getting one additional teammate? Um, well, essentially what will happen is tonight I'm going to send out a quick survey and I'll find out what the current blocks of teams are and then I'll mix and match them to try and keep teams together and get to four or five as best I can, okay? So just hold on essentially and I'll send out a survey.
say it ain't so, chow. So, um, it's hard to say. That's a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure. So usually what happens is we team up midway through our project three, we team up with, um, uh, students from the, the Pat 305 class, the video game music course to create music for us. And you get a little bit of extra credit for doing that. And we also often team up with, um, uh, people from the EMU game art program. Um, however, I'm not sure if they are going to do that again this semester. So maybe we will do that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that, it's it's still up in the air, but it, that kind of stuff won't happen for at least a few weeks. Uh, so I would just uh, kind of hang out and see what happens, okay? Ooh, this music is just incredible. Any questions, chat? Not a judge for the game jam. Not to my knowledge, anyway. I think next is Pokemon? Yep. I played so much Ruby back in the day. No, like I, I have very little interest in getting a, an upgraded graphics card anytime soon. Like I, uh, like I, the games I play usually aren't particularly graphically demanding anyway I, I really don't care that much if I play a game on like medium settings yeah these days I just don't really enjoy Pokemon like I used to like the, it's it's not I love the characters and the world is pretty neat but the gameplay is just very very predictable to me I don't know I don't even get that much like satisfaction out of grinding. Yeah. I, I, it, to me, the gameplay feels like, hey, are you the right type to counter your enemy's weaknesses? And if you, yes, stick with that Pokemon. If no, change Pokemon. And that's pretty much that's pretty much all the decision making I ever make.
Yeah, I, I also never played online. I guess I just never got into it. I remember, though, early Pokemon had some really nice puzzles, like navigational puzzles, where you'd step on a tile, and it'd set you moving in a certain direction, and you had to kind of figure out exactly which direction to go to get through the, the labyrinth. I remember there was, like, an ice cave where you had to... Once you started walking over ice, you couldn't stop until you hit something else or a wall. So you, uh, you had to really plan your route carefully through the cave, the ice cave. It was really... Those puzzles were great. <laughs> There were push block puzzles where if you pushed a boulder into the wrong area, you would permanently block yourself off, so you'd have to leave the room, come back in. Okay, all that's it. I uh, thank you for coming to the lecture. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, it, it's a little bit fragmented right now, but I hope you enjoyed the demonstration of uh, kind of inspecting your your code, hacking, modding, um, and uh, yeah, I hope you have a, a safe couple days. And we will see you again on Wednesday. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye bye.